last week, Friday, we had a dinner up at the Senate of Doctrine. And uh, we walked in. We had these little cards. And uh, one of them was a ticket for a prize on the table. Rose was a little heart and that uh, uh, for anything that uh, they would be thankful for. Well, after that, I had a whole week here. And it was, you know, you did it. <laughs> Got a whole lot from it now. And so, <clears throat> there's one thing that everybody has that goes through life. And without that, there would be nothing here. And in Genesis 2 7, God created man from dust, dust, and his breath. And he breathed life into him. And he become a living soul. Life is what people have from the time they're born until they die. And so that's one thing. Sometimes you take credit for or you don't uh, you don't think about it. Because it's just it's just bad. So anyway, go ahead and just share that. Scripture reading today of God's Word is in Deuteronomy 1 through 14. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live, increase, and it may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised for all to you, to your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these forty years to humble you and to test you in order to know that what was in your heart, wherever or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with mouth, feeding you with mouth which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these forty years. Now then in your heart, that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God. Walk in his ways and reverend him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams, with pools of waters, with springs flowing in the valley and hills, a land with wheat, barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, olives, oil, and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce, and you will lack nothing. A land where rocks are iron, and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I have given you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increases, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Timothy, James, James 4, 4 through 10. You adulterous people, 
Don't you know that friendship with the world is hated to, toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that the Spirit He caused to live in us envies in intensely, but He gives us more grace? That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud to give grace to the humble. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinner, and purify your heart. You double-minded, grievous, moan and wail. Change your language to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So be it. start with prayer. Father, we do thank you so much for being able to freely worship you in this land. Lord, help us not to forget your laws and decrees. Lord, that you are there because you love us so much. You create us and breathe the breath of life into us, like Merle said, because you desired that, Father. Not because we deserved it or anything else, but be, that you desired a relationship with us. The commands and decrees that you give us are for our well-being, and you provide everything for us, and we just thank you for that. Help us to be obedient. Help us to be submissive and be the light to this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this sermon is entitled, Enemies of God. And what does that mean to you? We're going to talk about that a little bit. But I want to start with exactly what Merle was saying. If you have a bulletin, there's a spot on the back that says sermon notes. What are you thankful for? Have you thought about it this week? You stole my idea. <laughs> Write it down. Think about it. What are you thankful for? I mean, it really gets something that you should think about. It's not just a laissez-faire statement or question. We have so much, but we take it for granted so much in this country. We are so blessed. We wake up in the morning and we go about our lives as we see fit because we don't have the things to worry about that other people have to worry about. We don't have to worry about whether our family is alive or dead or not because of some bombing or anything else. We don't have to worry about our freedoms being stripped away. There may be a day that that comes, but we take it so for granted. We get up and say, everything's going to be great today. I deserve a break today, so I'm heading to McDonald's and go then to go to Burger King to have it my way, right? I mean, we've got it made. So are we thankful? We're studying Romans, and Romans goes through, and Paul tells them his longing, his desire to preach the gospel, why he is obligated and everything. And then it goes on to say how mankind didn't recognize God for all of what things that creation said without even ever hearing the word of God, and neither were they thankful. So I just think it's important that we sit down and think about what we are thankful for. Because... Like I said, if we don't stop and th thank, then are we going to thank God? And He deserves to be thanked. He deserves to be worshipped. We should stand in awe of Him. Last week we talked about making every effort to keep unity. And we do that through the bond of peace. Paul gave us a few steps. <clears throat> we are to continue that process until we all reach unity. Ephesians 4, 3 said, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And in the end of our scripture passage in Ephesians 4, 13, it says, Until we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. I mean, that's the purpose. That's the purpose of this life and the purpose of our spiritual life, to grow to maturity. And then it says at the end of that verse, attaining the whole measure or stature of the fullness of Christ, to be like Christ. That's the purpose of our spiritual maturity. To remind you, unity is a state of being united as joined as a whole, oneness, one being with several parts operating together for the good of the one. It's something that God demands of His children. It's something that the church must live out especially if we're going to reach out to others and tell them about Jesus Christ. 
Paul urged believers, he begged believers, he pleaded with believers at the first of that chapter to realize the importance of what he had said in the first three chapters. And he said, we need to be united to live a life worthy of the vocation and calling that we have. Because we are heralds and messengers. We're not only to speak, but we're to live a life that glorifies God. So he begged his readers, the letter to the churches, this, this letter was to Ephesus, but it was a letter that was to be handed down to the different churches. He begged them to remember all the things that God had done for them, their, his goodness and mercy and grace. <clears throat> so Ephesians 4, 1 started out this way, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling or vocation you have received. And he gave us three steps. Be completely humble or lowliness, gentle or meek, be patient or long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the, of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Three steps. Maybe you remembered them. Maybe now you'll remember a little bit more since we're refreshing. Humbleness, gentleness, and patience. And we're going to look at James today and we're going to see some of those same words said again because we have to realize that that's the pattern that we have to partake. It's not easy. It's not something that may come naturally to us, but it's something that God demands, and it's something that His Spirit, that He gives us His Spirit so we can be able to do these things. We don't have to rely on our own. So as we get to James, James's point was, are you going to be a hearer of the Word, or are you going to be a doer also? He writes his letter to Christians, to Jewish Christians, who are scattered abroad and who are being persecuted. And because of their persecution they tend to say to themselves, well, maybe we just shouldn't be quite as bold in our faith. Maybe we should be hearers more, but let's skip the doing part a little bit because we might get persecuted for it. Well, we don't even have to worry about that in this country. We simply don't be the doers sometimes because we have things that are more important that rob our affections, and we'll see that today in James. We have a limited amount of time. There was a funeral here yesterday. There was a funeral here last week. That little dash on the tombstone, that amounts to your life here on this earth, the time that you spend. And there's been seconds, minutes since I've started talking that have already passed away. We've got a limited amount of time to live out the vocation and calling that God has given us, to live a life worthy rather than a life worthless. So if you're still breathing, there's still time. God still wants to use you. You still have the same vocation and calling. So James said, are you living wisely or are you living foolishly? In James chapter 3, verse 13, he writes, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life. By deeds done in humility. Oh, that was the first step of Paul, wasn't it? Humbleness. This humbleness will lead, lead you to live a worthy life, a wise life. A life that will be shown, that will be evident because of the good deeds that you do. Hopefully that is known today in our community Thanksgiving dinner. Why do we do this? Because we love one another because God first loved us. And He loved us enough to send His Son to die for our sins. Because God wanted a relationship with us. He wants us to be His children so that we can spend eternity with Him. <clears throat> Our first scripture reading from Deuteronomy told us to be careful to follow every command. Sometimes we think the Lord of the Old Testament is different than the Lord of the New Testament. But it's the same. He is the same. He loves us and gives us commands and ordinance for our protection, for our blessing. They're not something that, that He lays upon us that are hard and, hard and burdensome or because he wants to be a tyrant. There are things that he sets down for our good and our well-being. In Deuteronomy 8, 1, it said, Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today. Why? He gives us a reason again. So that you may live, increase, and may enter and possess the land which the Lord promised an oath to your ancestors. He gives us a blessing along with it, a condition. He says, I'm not just telling you to do this because I want you to do it. He says, I'm telling you to do this so that you may live, so that you may increase, and so that you may enter and possess the land which I promised you. God stands true to His covenants. We don't have to worry about what He says or does. And we don't have to worry that it's conditional upon us. These commands were given by a loving God to, for His people that He loves so much, His children. Deuteronomy 8.2 said, Remember how the Lord... 
this personal, intimate relationship we've had, that he loves us so much, that your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. See, we tend to think, wow, for 40 years I've had to do this and that. But for 40 years on the other side of the coin, God provided for us that our clothes didn't even wear out, that we didn't have to worry about what we had each day. So why would we mumble and groan? Why would we say praise God? We don't get up each day and have to put on an oxygen mask. He gives us oxygen. We have freedom in this country. We're blessed with such abundance. But when we have a bad day, we're like, Lord, where are you? Are you against me? He loves us so much. And nothing has changed. But he's looking for those children who follow his commands. Just like it's pleasing to you if your children follow and obey your commands. If you're a good father, you've given them these commands to protect them because you love them. You want to train them up. You don't give them these commands because you want to be a tyrant. You give them these commands to protect them because you love them. So do you keep his commands? Is your heart focused on him 100%? That's what Deuteronomy says, and we're going to see from James, if you didn't catch it, that he's saying the same thing. So therefore, why would you not let your light shine? Why would you not let your deeds be known? On the night before Jesus' death, he comforted his disciples because he knew that he was going to die and then he was going to leave. So he comforted them, and he told them that they would do even greater works than he did. Are we doing that today? That's what he told us that we would do. So if we're not doing that today, why not? John 14, 12 says, Very truly, I tell you, truly, truly, you can count on this, that I am the Lord and I am telling you, whoever believes in me will do works I have been doing. They will be doers, not hearers only. And they will do even greater things than these. So not only will we be doing the things that Jesus did, but we will be doing greater things. And that was kind of obvious in the early church. Twelve ordinary men got together, united by the power of the Spirit, and their numbers increased daily as a result. People even said, I don't care about the things that I have anymore. I'm going to sell all my possessions and give them to the church so there won't be anyone in need in this community. That is a Spirit-led believer. Exactly what Jesus intended. And they did mightier things than what Jesus did in just His ministry. The Spirit is what provides the power. The Spirit is what we have to rely on and let live through us so that we can keep Jesus' commands, so that we can live and proclaim a life that is worthy in the absence of Jesus. Jesus goes on to tell his brothers and sisters in verse 15 of John 14, If you love me, keep my commands. In verse 21, he says, Who, Whosoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. We hear it again a second way. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So here's a litmus test again. Here's, here's a way that we can tell. If you love Jesus, you will do what? Keep his commands. So here's the question. Do you love Jesus? And if you do, if you say you do, are you keeping His commands? What do you have to be thankful for? He's loved you so much. Are you thankful enough that you will do what Paul says, what James says, where they urge you, desperately plead with you to live a life that is worthy? Or will you live it for yourself, saying, I'm really not that thankful for what you've done for me, God? And as we get to the New Testament, we see not only what he did for the nation of Israel, but we see what he did for every single being because God himself came down, lived as a creation, and died for them so that they could spend eternity with God instead of apart from God. Jesus tells us twice in these two verses, verse 15 and 21, that we might keep his commands, right? Not that we might. How about should keep his commands? No, it doesn't say should either. You might want to look in your Bible just to see. Maybe you have a translation that reads differently, but I don't think you'll find one that says might or should. Jesus says that if you love him, you will keep his commands. But I can't do that, right? No, I can't. Because I'm a sinner and, I, a sinner and I desire the sins of the flesh. But if I die daily to him, 
I put these banners up. No greater love that we have that God gave His only Son so that we take up our cross daily and follow Him because that's what we're called to do. I put these up as a remembrance and to decorate the church because it looks nice. But that's what we're supposed to do and we have to remember it daily that our life is not our own. We have to rely on the power and we have to be thankful to God for what He has done. Even in the times that we want to moan and groan and say, I'm out in the wilderness for 40 years, instead of seeing that you've provided for me for 40 years and I didn't even have to go down to Walmart and buy new clothes because the ones I had lasted for 40 years. God is a loving God. Jesus goes on to say in verse 23 and 24 of John 14, Anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. Those words you hear are not my own. They belong to the, to the Father who sent me. Now, this is a deep verse. We're going to spend a lot of time on it, but he says a couple things. He says the same thing we've already heard, that if you love him, you'll obey his commands. But he also says the exact opposite. It's black or white. It's not gray. He says, if you don't obey my teachings... You are the one who does not love me. Now, does that mean that if you don't obey this particular teaching that you don't love Jesus? No, it's the course of your life. We're all going to fall. We're all going to stumble. But if there's not growth to maturity, if you're not going in the right direction of loving God, if there's never any evidence or deeds, then you might want to question your love for God. It's pretty clear here what Jesus is saying in His love for Him. There will be signs that your heart is focused on Him and that you want to obey Him. Will we struggle? Yes. And that's why we're supposed to meet together with the church, with the body of believers, so they can strengthen us. That's why we've all been given gifts so that we can minister to each other. He knows it's going to be tough. That's why He comes to live with us every second of every day to empower us, to comfort us, to show us the way so that we're not alone. The word here, though, is not that commands, it's teachings. It's the same word, logos, which is, which is translated as word. It encompasses more than commands here. So Jesus is going to make a stronger point here. He's saying, if you love me earlier, you'll keep my commands, what I've told you to do. Love thy neighbor. But he's saying here, anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. The whole word of God. The thought process of God that used to be a mystery that is now revealed to you of why He loves you and why He sent His Son. Everything to do with the written Word. It's the same word used in John 1, 1 when it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So it's obeying everything that the Bible teaches you, the whole concept of why God loved the world so much that He would give His only Son. Why He put us as His hands and feet because we should love each other as Christ loved, so that we can go to our brother and sister and love them instead of being a hypocrite and persecute them and point fingers at them. So that we can love like Christ, so that hopefully that they'll know Jesus Christ and they'll become a son or daughter of God forever, for all of eternity. In John 1, 14, it's the same word. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The same word is teachings. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. We're to be Christians, to be like Christ, to be submissive, faithful, and obedient. That we have, He says, if anyone who loves me will obey my teachings, then, there's the promise given again, there's always that promise there, my Father will love them, and we all persons of the Trinity, will come to them and make our home with them. Temple's right here now. I don't have to go somewhere else and worship. God comes to me, and His temple is in my heart of the true believer. Wow. That's just amazing to even try to comprehend that. If you're not obeying Jesus' teachings, why? Are you not thankful enough? Did He not do enough? Was Jesus' death on the cross not enough to require your submission? Our second scripture this morning was from James chapter 4. And we need to start in James 3 first. It said, Are you living a life foolishly or wisely? 
In 3.13 he said, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that, come for, that comes from wisdom. We read that. Then he goes on to say, verse 14, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast. Do not glory in it or do not be proud, but instead have humbleness and humility, right? <clears throat> if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, or deny the truth, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But, the opposite, the wisdom that comes from heaven, first of all, is pure, peace-loving. We talked about peacemakers last week. Considerate, submissive. We talked about submissive. Full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers, again, who sow in peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. James is telling us that if we want to live wisely, we have to be submissive again. The first thing is submitting to God's will versus our own. And then our lives and deeds will show it. Paul said we needed to be submissive, pay, gentle and meek, patient and long-suffering so that we could have unity. And James is telling us to be submissive here so that our deeds and actions will show it because we won't live by our will but we'll live by His. Matthew 5, 9 said, Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called what? The children of God, His children. So what causes disunity and divisions? Why is there a lack of peace and bonding in the body of believers? Peace should be present in the church for unity. It should bond just like a ligament so that it, I can control that. It joins this together where the head can use this arm as pleasing to it so that I obey Jesus Christ, my head and my Lord. James continues, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Well, I don't like to think of myself that way, but it's true. Uh, Jesus said, I, I des you desire but do not have, so you kill. I'm not a murderer. But Jesus said, if you thought it in your heart, you've, you're, you're guilty of it. Hmm, maybe I am. So what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? Well, I don't like to think that, but when it all comes down to it, um, I like what I like. I don't really care as much what you like, so there's where my quarrels and divisions come from, doesn't it? So I have to learn to be submissive. So maybe he's right. I don't like to hear it. But maybe he's right. James 4.4 4 then says pretty clear, you adulterous people. Now why did he use that word? Because see, God meant everything with a covenant that he made with you. You may be familiar that marriage is called a covenant because we're not supposed to break those vows. Well see, God doesn't break his vows to us. Whew. Praise God. It's not conditional upon us. But what do we do with a God that loves us more than I could ever fathom loving my wife or she could love me in a marriage covenant? We are adulterous to Him. We cheat on Him. We cheat on Him with the desires of this world. I don't want to do what you've called me to do to, to, today, Lord, because I had this in mind for today. This was my plan. And I don't want to mess it up. So I cheat on Him. Or I say, I don't have time to read my Bible, really don't have it. I got, I got this TV show I got to watch and keep up with. Wow. And we're all guilty of it. I'm not pointing fingers at you. I'm telling things from my experience. Telling on myself. I'm cheating on the one who loved me enough to give his son for me. So it goes on to say, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend with the world becomes an enemy of God. I don't like to think of myself as an enemy of God, but that's what James is saying, isn't it? 
I've made him an enemy. Wish we had our little Awanas kids in here. What's Romans 5, 8 say? Does anybody know? I'm sure they would probably know that verse. Shame on us. So what do you think it says? But God demonstrated His love. Keep reading though. Since we, now, since we have now been justified by His blood, by Jesus' blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? What we deserved. Next verse, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through this life? Enemies. See, the problem when you're adulterous is you live the same way you lived before as an enemy of God. What a shame. We go right back to living the exact same way that we did before, gratifying the lusts and desires of the flesh, rather than serving a God who loved us enough that He stayed with us and been committed with us, continues to give us oxygen, every blessing that there is, and us so much more in this land, and sends His Son to die for us, that we say, I'm going to go right back to living the same way I was, as an enemy of God. That's a pitiful and wretched state that James is telling us. If you look in your bulletins, it is not saying this. I looked up for... Um, illustrations and looked up James 4.4 4, and I got this if you like being around unsaved people and they like being around you you are a friend of the world and an enemy of God I don't see how anybody could get that out of this scripture whatsoever I can be friends with this world to shine my light now that comes with maturity again I need to be careful so that they don't bring me down but it doesn't mean at all what that person said from this but it does mean a lot more what the one the says below, we are called to be world changers, not world chasers. See, I am still part of the world, but I'm an alien in this world. I still have to live in it and reside in it. But my purpose is to be an ambassador and a herald of what God has done through Jesus Christ. I shouldn't love the world and the desires of the world. That's what it's talking about, being friends of the world. And it's, this word is only used here in the Bible, period. It says you can't be in love with the world and have a mistress in the world and say that you love God. You're cheating on Him. You adulterous people. Do you not understand it? That that friendship, that love with the world makes you an enemy of God. He goes on to say in verse 5, Or do you think, Scripture says, within reason, without reason, that He jealously longs for the Spirit He has called to dwell in us? If you study this verse, you're going to find a lot of different interpretations here. You've got to remember that there's not punctuation and that there's not capitalization in the original manuscripts. We don't know here if this is referring to the Holy Spirit or if it's talking about a spirit in man. So some people say that it's man's spirit longing jealously for the things of the world. But that really doesn't fit the pattern of this scripture if you continue reading the whole thing. Maybe it means that God Himself, God the Father, longs jealously for your love because of the Spirit He's put in, in us. Now that one works. I like that one. But it also can mean that the Holy Spirit that is inside of you longs for you to listen to Him, to be obedient to Him before the love affair that He has with you. That one works. Either way, I like that. What it says is that God loves me in all forms of the Trinity because Jesus loved me enough to die for me that all parts of God love me jealously. And don't look at jealousy as a bad thing because if some guy comes and hits on my wife, I'm going to be jealous. It's a good thing because it shows how much I love her. I don't want to share her love with any other man, especially my intimacy with her. So if any man does that, he's going to find a jealous husband. There's nothing wrong with that. Now what I do with that is something different. So let's read on to see what God does with it. In verse 6, but, complete opposite of me going out and being enraged and him going out and being enraged, he said he gives us more grace. Wow, what a God. He gives us more grace, more of what we don't deserve and just throws it on and lavishes it. Grace upon grace. What, that is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor or gives more grace to the humble. 
So are you humble or are you proud? Who are you submissive to? Your own wills or God's wills? It's a daily step. Paul told us to be completely humble, gentle, and patient. Bearing with one another in love. To make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Matthew 23, 12 says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, here's the thing. Maybe you don't understand it. Maybe you do. I can choose to humble myself on this earth. And it has to be something that I decide to do from my heart. Or I will be humbled in heaven. That's what he's saying. There will be places of honor. I might make it to heaven. I might have the fire insurance. I might believe. But James says, I find it hard to believe if you're, you're not showing it with your deeds. That there should be growth to maturity. But maybe your faith is genuine and maybe you will believe, but you will, not be hum you will be humbled in heaven. You will not be exalted. With a person that's here, there are tons of verses that says the person that is here that humbles himself and gives up this life. Look at the twelve apostles. They will be recognized forever in heaven on the foundations of the kingdom. You can do it here or you can do it there. Or you might miss the boat entirely. So what does James say in, chapter, in verse 7? Then submit yourselves. Now I beg you, I plead with you. There's a therefore in the King James so that you understand because of what I've said previously, you have to submit yourself. And there's another promise again. If you submit yourself to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Wow! He gives me this promise that the devil will flee from me. You see, that's what happens because if you have the power of God in you, the devil's going to run and hide. Now, I'm not telling you just to go do that to test him because, again, you need to be mature in everything else. But that's a promise that God says. If you submit yourself to him wholeheartedly, trusting in him that you'll do mightier things, Jesus has already told that, and he says here to resist the devil and he will flee from you. And it means to flee, to leave. To seek safety by flight, fleeing, or vanishing. The devil, devil is seeking a safe place because God has the power inside of you. What a mighty verse. goes on to say, Come or draw near to God and He will come and draw near to you. Another promise that's outstanding. God does not want to be apart from you. He wants to have a relationship with you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse 9 says, Grieve, mourn, and wail. The King James Version says, Be afflicted, mourn, and weep. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. What it means is be humbled. Grieve for the things of this world, for the sins of the flesh, for people that are trapped in those sins, because you're not bound to that anymore. You're free to live a life of Christ. But you're also free to continue to live as an enemy of God if you want to, because your sins have been justified. But it is God's will that you be sanctified, made holy, set apart for the purpose that's called for you. James is saying the same thing that Paul is saying. You're privileged to have a part in the gospel message. Can you see this? Do you understand this? So I beg you and I plead with you to take up a life worthy, to lay your lives down as a humble sacrifice daily. And then verse 10 says, he says it again, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He won't do anything, right? No, He will lift you up. What a promise. What a God we serve. Do you understand this? Are you willing to humble yourself and let Him do everything that He's promised for you to give you a life that you just won't ever even imagine the glory and things that He will have for fulfillment in your life? Or you can chase after the things of this world and follow a lie and deception. But God has so much more in store for you if you'll just humble yourself. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the words of James, the words of Paul. We thank you for their lives. We thank you that you took men that tried to destroy the way or that had a, didn't have enough power in themselves to, to, to spread the gospel message that they ran and hid when Jesus was being crucified. But you gave them the power through the Holy Spirit to be mighty men of God. And that same power resides in each and every one of us. Lord, help us to realize that, to submit ourselves, to live a holy life, 
Because there is a world out there that is hurting and that needs you so desperately. And every second goes closer to the life that we have that in the ceases or the time when Jesus returns. Lord, help us to be observant of this. Help us to be a, an impending thing upon our hearts that we will serve you in submission out of love. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.